We've never been in a situation where we have to govern something that is going to be smarter than us. And I, th I feel like we're fundamentally unprepared for that. It's a space race. The company or country that cracks artificial general intelligence first will dictate humanity for the next 100 years. Who has more power to regulate? Is it big tech or is it governments? Evidence suggests it looks like big tech. We've never been in a situation where we have to govern something that is going to be smarter than us. Mm -hmm. And I, th I feel like we're fundamentally unprepared for that yes. because naturally all, all power has this recursive element, you know, Yes, the people give Parliament sovereignty, but then Parliament sets the laws that dictates how people can behave and, and frame society and so on. But now we're in a situation, we're moving to a situation where we have to govern something which will be multitudes and magnitudes smarter than us in all of the important ways in two, three years. I, I haven't heard particularly robust <laughs> ideas for how we, how we cope with that. And I laugh with this nervous laughter. I think there's a fundamental problem um, is that this is playing out on a global stage, yeah, yeah. not a local stage. Yeah. Um, and this is a new space race. You could mm. say arms race, but yeah. it's a space race mm -hmm. and it's faster than any rocket that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, and if you slow down one country, if one country feels there's an ethical need to put in place much stronger governance, explain the AI, make sure the data sets are properly tuned and trained and there's no bias. Another country that chooses not to do that and to accelerate and go faster yeah. and throw those ethics out of the window a little bit, well, they are going to be the winners. Mm -hmm. There's just no two ways about it. And if you're a technologist, like you, know, you are Bob and myself, particularly have been playing with this sort of technology for years now, mm -hmm. It's a little voice inside your head that says that the, the company or country that cracks artificial general intelligence first will dictate humanity for the next hundred years. Yeah. And so it's a race. Who's going to get there first? Is it going to be the West? Is it going to be China? Is it going to be an independent company somewhere? I haven't, you know, nobody's got a crystal ball. Who and knows? That, that's what we've been seeing out of the US. And it, it seems like the, the threat barometer appears divided between those who are worried about the more immediate threat and risk that is occurring through these emergent models, and then the macro greater threat of losing out in the race to AGI and what that will mean for your country's relative position. And we saw at Paris, you know, there was a yes. lack of international consensus. The UK and the US did not sign the agreement. Um, and so it's a question of, I mean, is global cooperation, is it, can it be pursued? Is it too late already? I think there's this, this fundamental decision where you regulate. Are you trying to regulate on the side of, of the innovative models that are being built, the so-called foundation models, which, as Matt said, you know, moving incredibly rapidly and where you are getting this emergent behaviour and, and we're, we're less sure of, of how that's going to develop over the next six months even? Or do you focus your regulation more on the application side, right? We're all going to be using these models. Enterprises are going to be using these models. Uh, if we assume that they're going to continue to develop a pace, well, what does that mean we need to think about when we're applying it in manufacturing or, or healthcare or, or finance? And you know, we've seen that the, the EU AI Act is coming down more on, on that side, right? Because it's not just about innovation, it's about application as well. Um, but in some ways they're losing the, um, the war of public perception um, because you know, it's viewed as overly onerous. And it's not clear to me actually looking at, uh, you know, what you have to do that it is particularly onerous, right? It's basically saying a lot of the time, you know, if you're in a, a high risk industry, um, you have to make certain declarations, you have to make certain checks, these are things that we would tend to do uh, operating in those industries anyway. Um, but the US, China, they can capitalize on that message and say, come to us, you know, we, we're the, the lands of opportunity. And it does put the EU on the back foot. So I think where you regulate is going to be a key part of this. But then when you think about that, AI is essentially borderless, isn't it? And laws are national. And then, so you've got that idea. And, and that's why we get this tension, I think. And then you think about um, nation states and the US and the UK, very much market driven, um, so focused on innovation and growth. 
using this technology. Then you've got the EU highly regulatory oriented. You know, let's let's try and put some laws in place that that curtail it and contain it. And then you've got China, which is all about sovereignty and data and centralisation. And I guess the the question is, you know, how how can companies stay ahead of shifting laws, legal frameworks, AI compliance? How can they do that? And what can we do to help them stay ahead of it? So do you think, so who has more power to regulate? Is it big tech or is it governments? That's a really tricky question to ask me right now, <laughs> because the evidence suggests it looks like big tech. Um, and nation states need to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's a, I think there's a tension there. And it will always be big tech during the regulatory lag. And now that lag yes. is ever increasing because the speed of technological change and progress is increasing and government doesn't seem like it's got any faster or more responsive to that. In my laundry list of things that, that keep me up at night, other, other than the fact that we're trying to govern something that's going to be more intelligent than us. It is this borderless nature of AI and the ubiquity. Other than the COVID-19 pandemic, I can't think of anything that is so ubiquitous and effect, will affect all of our lives globally in the same way. And yes, we have supranational institutions, but they, don't, they often don't have teeth. And I think we almost need a, a new body. Like I was thinking, in the way that the WHO monitors health risk, do we need a, an intelligence body that is monitoring AI risk that has a sort of red, yellow, green approach to new development that could be a means for global risk assessment, cooperation, even intervention if things get very dangerous? Which brings up the whole, I mean, if, you, if, you've, got, if you've got an institution looking at risk, then they by nature have to look at opportunity as well because there has to be a balance. But then when risks run away with themselves, and we've seen it on the stock market, mm. we probably need to build in an off switch. Mm -hmm. So how does off switching work when something's gone rogue or gone down uh, the path that it was not designed to do? So there is that whole capability. I'll leave it to the technologists to say <laughs> whether that's possible, but off switching seems like something we absolutely need to do and we need to do that at pace when something's gone. I mean, right. I, do, I do see parallels to the to the financial services industry. I mean, I I was at Lehman Brothers when um, when, when two thousand eight happened and, and became very interested in the the concept of systemic risk. Right. So, mm -hmm. you talked about the regulatory lag, Bianca, and I think that exists in finance as well. Banks can regulate each other, but it's when they start. Sorry, they can regulate themselves when they start interacting, though that's when you get these strange behaviours and it becomes more difficult. And um, it was easy to show, you know, even if all the banks were fulfilling their regulatory needs, that didn't necessarily mean you have a safe system. And, and I think we've got something similar. And so the off switch, there probably needs to be one within the company themselves using the AI, but there has to be an off switch for the network, you know, how they're all talking to each other. And so we have to design those, those patterns of interaction and. That's what I see over the next few years being a sort of crucial area as we see the rise of agents, mm -hmm. something we need to get on top of. How are these agents going to interact, talk with each other, create their own protocols? How do they do that in a way that we can still get comfortable from a regulatory perspective? I think that's one of the big challenges we'll see.